Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, be most welcome, ladies and gentlemen, students, professors, guests, and uh, attendees and speakers. Uh, let me start by uh, thanking Professor Spada, as well as Rita Brito and all the IEP staff team uh, for making this amazing conference possible, uh, especially uh, amidst these complicated uh, circumstances we are living today and currently. Uh, I would also like to start to apologize for the transmission yesterday at the end. And I'd let you know that yesterday's final session was suddenly interrupted and some of us lost connection uh, because um, of a lightning uh, strike that interfered with the connection and, uh, and um, disconnected partially uh, some of the streaming system. Uh, most of the attendees were able to restore the connection, others not so much, like myself, we are sorry for this. Um, we must say that this happened right after half past seven, um, so we were supposed to close by that time. Uh, this is perhaps good to remind us to finish and to start on time. The panel and the speakers, however, um, were able to resume the conversation and were not even aware of this technical issue. Um, I must add, therefore, that the whole session was backed and saved, is stored in our files and to be available, made available in due course. Um, let me thank you very much indeed for attending the Thucydides Garden session. Uh, now, one of the most iconic and inspiring moments of the Istudil Political Forum. I even have here the image of how things used to be. It used to be at a palace hotel. This year, unfortunately, we are not sipping tea or uh, drinking coffee at the Palacio Hotel, as we are supposed to. But fingers crossed that next year we will make it. Finally, uh, let me thank and introduce the speakers of this session. Uh, they are all undergraduate students, and we are very proud of them. They are students who excelled in uh, geopolitics, uh, one of the main courses of the degree, um, a course dedicated to the study with proper care of one of the most important great books of the Western civilization, The Peloponnesian War. Uh, wrote by Thucydides not long ago, just 25 centuries ago. It's a very recent book. And the students uh, will be Patricia Inez Vaz, first speaker, Margarita Jackson Lee, or Margaret Lee, hello, and also Luis Simas, Luis Miguel Simas, hello, hello. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and uh, don't forget, you only have five minutes. So it will be very quick. Let me also introduce you um, the chairs of the session. Uh, Professor Miguel Monjardino, the teacher and instructor who teaches this very famous course uh, the, about the Peloponnesian War. And Professor Anthony O'Hear, a world expert on the great books tradition. Uh, they are both very supportive of the liberal artes, or artes liberales curriculum and of the Great Books Tradition curriculum, um, of which our Bachelor of Arts, our undergraduate studies here at the Institute for Political Studies, um, we are part of. And uh, without further ado, let me give the floor to the first speaker, Patricia Inês Vaz. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, hello. Uh, for me, reading two cities was an interesting and challenging experience. But above all, I think it was crucial and beneficial to nowadays understand how the states and great powers hacked, since the author made a completely uh, approach uh, of international relations and the importance of factors has power, influence, diplomacy, strategy, among others. One of the most relevant elements of the, of the history for me was the capacity of action by great leaders in an, in an expected moment. When the plague emerged in Athens, I think uh, the Pericles did everything he could to maintain the order in the city. And I think the professor Miguel 
did the same when the emergence with the emergence of the virus in March. Um, from Zoom meetings and Skype meetings, reorganization of schedules and conversations, our Facebook group. What I'm trying to emphasize is if we are in today talking about the CDDs, it's all because the professor has a great leader, made a really good job in a moment of instability for everyone. And we did it. I think we achieved our goal and we are here today. These two leaders showed me uh, that we can improve our action, even if the moment we are going through, it's not the best one, not a happy one, and not a stable one. Regarding the process uh, of achieved goals, Demosthenes was a general that remembered me how important um, is to be resilient. His first missions didn't went in the best ways, but he learned from his mistakes and made himself a better general, which is exactly what I'm trying to do as a person, a friend, and everything. Um, among the wars between Sparta and Athens, I realized how financial area is important to put a strategy into um, a practice. Athens was a city with huge economic capacities, including um, a persons of naval, commercial, and financial uh, empire, which allowed in the course of the situations to a constantly innovation of strategies. Uh, while Sparta in opposite was a conservative and continental power that did not have as many resources as Athens did. Uh, surviving through um, uh, agrarian ways. Uh, to demonstrate uh, this opposition between the two powers, I'd like to quote from this book, The Landmark of Thucydides, two sentences on the page 82 and 83, which the author says, Athenians here power will be more effective against them on land then their land power against Athens and Sia. And then the author uh, quotes to Cydides and say, value most our Sia power and its ability to provide us resources from our empire. Here, what I'm trying to emphasize, and I think uh, it's important for us to reflect, it's our economic sources can be really important in terms of power, how they uh, influence politics and how Hattons manage resources among several circumstances. Um, just to conclude my intervention, uh, behind the Mosinus, there was a other Chinese general that I really fan, uh, felt in love, which is Sun Tzu. Uh, he's a um, Chinese general. And I, wrote, I read this book in April when I wrote the essay about the Mosinus. Uh, and now I'm reading again with more uh, attention. But what I would like to say is for the ones who are really interested in this subject, I think it's a really good book. It's not uh, that big, it's a really small, but it's really complete and approached um, really uh, very subject has uh, conflicts, operations, strategics, how to face the enemy, generals, and among others. And I'd like to show also this photograph that I think it's really nice and cool. And yes, I, I would like to conclude my uh, presentation to thank you so much to Professor for inviting me to be here today and to Yepe for all the experience and knowledge I obtained until today. Thank you very much. We thank, thank you. you, Patricia, Ines Vaz. And now I pass the floor or the virtual floor to mm -hmm. Margarida Jackson Lee. Thank you, Margarida, you have the floor. Hi, uh, thank you, Professor. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start by thanking Professor Miguel Mujerdin for giving me this opportunity, because more than an honor, um, it is a chance to discuss, reflect, and deepen who was, in my opinion, one of the most complex and sensational books from my undergraduate uh, years. Starting with the background story, um, I was really scared. I mean, 
you would too if you had the welcoming text that I got from um, a student when I first started reading Thucydides. So um, this is a real story. When I found out that Professor Monjardinus' um, evaluation was based on several essays and an oral exam, I had the most common reaction to this, uh, which is fear. So I rushed to text a fellow uh, colleague who had already graduated from IEP. Um, and I asked her to give me some tips. And when she replied back with a text who said, that said, do not stress, but I didn't do very well at it. My instant reaction was to stress. <laughs> and, but rapidly, I realized that the CDDs is just different for everyone. The perception you get from this book is yours, and it can have several interpretations. So only when I started writing about him, that's when I found, I found out who he was for me. So celebrating the CDDs is not as easy as it seems. Um, while I was planning this conversation, I came across too many details that I would like to share and for which there is simply not enough time. But while I was having this mental debate, I realized that the CDDs is just like that. He is the personification of a tragic description of those who did not know how long they would have to write a book in the uncertainty of whether it would ever be read or even ever finished. And this is what elevates this text to a higher category because its descriptions are as detailed as possible because its characters carry political and social lessons to this day. And all because this author on the verge of one of the greatest wars of mankind had the courage to abdicate one of his greatest fortunes that you can have during a war, which is time. All in favor of us, future generations. So going straight to the point, I think that we, these future generations, endowed with historical knowledge, can easily transpose these events that the CDDs once described into our daily life. At different points in the work, we automatically associate current moments or a recent past to uh, what he is describing. And as Karl Marx once wrote, history repeats itself first as a tragedy and then as a farce. And the truth is that the farce can be deliberately projected as an alternative to this truth. So as a proof of my comment, I would like to introduce uh, the one who for me, for several reasons, turned out to be the most interesting character, perhaps because he is so enigmatic and it's for sure the most controversial. And he created a lot of debate in our class. And I mean, obviously Alcibiades. Um, in addition to his physical appearance, he was considered the most beautiful man of his time. His entire figure resembles the God of Thunder, which interestingly, Zeus was constantly described as a womanizer with a difficult temper, overwhelming pride, supernatural intelligence. So you cannot miss and ignore the similarities of both of these. His unique personality was critical for the political or orientation in Athens. And so even after his apparent betrayal, where he exiled himself in Sparta, which was the enemy, by the way, he continued to have supporters. So his talented manipulation allowed him to be incoherent without anyone suspecting him and keep himself um, always. Um, what I mean by this is that he always maintained and preserved himself, paying due homage to this survival, survival instinct and ability to take advantage of his enemies rectified that this does not make him a memorable strategic. In fact, he had never managed to command a victory, whether at sea or on land. All of his high strategic productions became monumental failures. So he was intelligent and hypnotic, loyal only to himself. And without taking into account his weaknesses, we know for a fact that he exploited the city's flaws for private purposes, neglecting hard-won democratic uh, principles. And for some, he was re a relentless traitor, dangerously self-absorbed and a probably a uh, tyrant, which in Greek is actually an unelected autocrat, which he was. Others influenced by his touch saw the stories and his excesses with captivation. 
So the lesson that I think that we can bring for today is that removing smiling masks, we can still find dangerous politicians just like Alcibiades today. As for the war itself, without wanting to make the whole story known or to spoil anything, so that the curiosity of reading this great work remains, one can conclude that from the ashes, a new nation was reborn. So war results for good and for evil, and it can bring lasting peace, generally when one of the sides accepts defeat or ceases its complaints, uh, whether in freedom or tyranny. And in the sense, for natural or circumstantial reasons, both of these cities were destined to choose different paths in the political panorama. However, the truth is that Thucydides opened space for reflection. He valued debate and negotiation, and regardless of the regime, that's the legacy that the Peloponnesian War leaves. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much indeed, Margarita <laughs> Jackson Lee. And now we pass the virtual floor to Luis Miguel Simas. Thank you, Luis Simas, the floor is yours. Thank you, host, chairs, most cherished colleagues. First of all, I would like to uh, congratulate the Institute and all the organizing team for uh, successfully arranging this solution, which overcame the contingencies we have upon us and made another edition of Surreal Political Forum possible. You know, um, it's curious that when Professor Miguel Monjardino invited me to speak with you on my impressions of what we've read from Thucydides, the first thought that came to my mind brought me back to a moment back in my life when I didn't even know who Thucydides was. You see, I remember having this conversation with Professor Orlando, who hosts this panel, in terms of how mesmerized I was with the beginning of the first year of the BA's program, especially with the seminar on international relations theory, where I just had my first contact with some million dialogue in the context of the Peloponnesian War, of which, quite frankly, <laughs> I'd never heard about, given the time span between Athens' golden fifth century and ours. And I was all excited about how much I had learned from it um, in, Professor, in Professor Olivia Franco's class, the elementary basis for realism, idealism, and all that follows. And hearing that, Professor Orlando, with major wisdom, told me those emotions would only increase in, in intensity at the last semester, because he told me, all IEP students, after being fully introduced to Thucydides' work, feel as such, as, as a cycle has been closed, one initiated precisely at the moment I was then celebrating. I nodded my head in approval, but deep down, I suspected that when I get to my last year, I would have for certain forgotten about the poor million's fate and all that came with it. Little did I know that Thucydides' inputs would stick with me long until I officially met him, under the soundtrack of ACDC's Hell's Bells, meticulous, meticulously played on YouTube, full screen and out loud by Professor Monjardino at our very first class. In the one that followed, boom, the Theban night assault, 300 men of Thebes, wet and mud soaked, snuck into the town of Plataea, with murder on their minds. Their attempt to launch revolution inside was futile. Most would die before the night was over. Us students were just staring at each other, astonished, but also thinking. Indeed, Professor Mongiardino, to see it is rocks. From then on, I could not just read the cities without feeling his every single word and putting myself into his shoes, into the shoes of the characters he had developed experiencing the scenarios he had portrayed, hearing the speeches he reconstituted. Thus, I cannot see him merely as a great historian, but as a literary author. This follows a standard approach to many great works. The idea that the author is not so much presenting a story as much as attempting, attempting to engage with the reader, getting them to question their own preconceived notions about a subject, essentially to create a dialectic in which the reader is able to achieve a higher level of understanding through a process of reading, questioning, contemplating, and then going on to the next related element, while at the same time retaining the conceptual whole and how the various elements are related. For this reason, I consider Thucydides 
as both the first and the last chapter of our great books tradition here at the Institute. In my first year, as I said, I was intrigued with that small trailer on the history of the Peloponnesian War, sorry. But I didn't even know what I was missing. You see, those who limit their acquaintance with Thucydides to a few snapshots miss a great opportunity. There is more to Thucydides than a frantic search to find another model for all time. I mean, if one takes a hard enough look, the seeker of evergreen political models or eternal laws of war will find what they are looking for in Thucydides. Though it is hard for me to believe that any thinker as subtle as he would smile on this quest. What I value in Thucydides is something different altogether. I do not turn to him for templates for all time, but for an escape from my time. We all live in the moment, a cacophony of words like buttons, notifications, pictures and sounds, follow us wherever we go, broadcast into our workplaces, our homes and our pockets. We live in an escapable eco chamber, an eco chamber relentlessly focused on the now. Not so with the cities. His history is about many things, but 2020 is not one of them. Although we have a plague amongst ourselves as well. Here, then, is a chance to put the present to the side, cast away that dreadful election, muffle the drowning of the news and, ca ca <laughs> and casualties reports, close the Twitter stream. Before us is a world that has never heard of the 21st century nor imagined its problems. Your guide to this world will be a man from an alien past. His values and assumptions will be starkly different than your own. Wrestle with him. Let your beliefs and assumptions be tested. What better chance to assay the building blocks of your politics than by exploring the politics of a different age removed from the passions of the moment? Thucydides does not spell out his lessons for you. Instead, he invites you to follow along with him and find what lessons history allows by yourself. This is a long process, for Thucydides' history is a long book, but it does not go on forever. When you come out, at the other hand, as I did, you will be ready to face the present again, hopefully more thoughtful, wise, and penetrating than when you began. The end of a cycle, as Professor Orlando told me. My hope is that I will carry a little of what I have learned with me wherever else I go. To see this under place at, let's say, my internal council table. A spot has been saved for him near the doorway between the seats given to Tocqueville and Montesquieu. One day, he might sit opposite to Kant. The next day, he will debate with Burke. In all cases, I will be glad to hear his voice. On a stormy night like yesterday's, I invite him, or at least so I imagine, to a cozy side room, warmed by a great fireplace and graced with two old armchairs. I ask him to sit down and bear kindly the interrogations I still keep in mind. How should I read your book? Should it be understood as a work of what we call history or literature or social science? How can I distinguish between your narrative of events and the events themselves? Could your explanations be wrong? How would I know? And why, for heaven's sake, did you not tell us when and how the Athenians passed the sanctions on Megara? <laughs> Luckily for you, Thucydides no longer lives in flesh and blood. I'm almost finishing, Professor Orlando, thank you. I cannot secret him enough to my study for weeks on end to prevent others from stealing his company. Everyone reading this has an equal claim to the historian. All can spend their evenings considering his words. I invite you to do so. Question him about his work. Argue with him about war and power. Badger him about what he might think of the conflicts in Karabakh or the South China Sea. Ask away. Just remember to write down what you've learned and share it with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Luis Simas. And now I will pass the floor to the chairs. Um, please uh, let me perhaps introduce one of the questions that I have already here. 
So you may comment on the three speakers and at the same time, perhaps um, try not to answer, but at least to comment on, on this uh, question. The question is posed by, uh, Andre, uh, by Professor Andres Vidwalsh. And he asks, how would you reply to the common criticism that this approach does not have practical applicability in the contemporary world by this, um, this approach, he probably meant the liberal arts or the great books curriculum approach. Perhaps this could be to Professor Anthony you're here. Um, well, I think in a way that question has already been answered by Luis Miguel, um, who says that in Thucydides, we get an escape from our own time so he's not writing about 2020, thank goodness one might say. Um, and I think that Margarita, it was who pointed out that Thucydides conceived himself as writing for the future. So he also wasn't writing exactly for his own time. He was trying to get a perspective on these terrible events, but in a way that would um, have both meaning and, and I, I hate to use this word, but relevance for all time. And precisely because it's not about only a, about a specific time, it's a, it, there's a universal aspect to it. Uh, Machiavelli, I believe, said that each night after he'd done his work, whether it was nefarious or otherwise, he would retire to his room and put on his dressing gown and converse with the ancients. And I think he principally meant Livia, in fact, but maybe Thucydides was, was one of the ancients, or certainly would have been. And it, it seems to me that um, th there's so much that is key for us, because what Thucydides shows us is as you know, our, our speakers have so eloquently put, he sees men and war and decisions and resilience and action. And he sees how people shaped up to this and how they didn't. And that is learning about humanity. Um, I think also we can learn from Thucydides that at least it seems to me, maybe Professor Monjardino will disagree, but he's often taken as being um, a realist in, in the Hobbesian sense that, you know, um, human life is nasty, brutish and short, and it's just power that is really the, the key to everything. And that is true. But Thucydides also, in my opinion, um, gives the most coruscating criticism of the Athenians, his own side, not in the way that Alcibiades betrayed Athens. He calls Athens to what they should be in the Melian dialogue. And whether the Melian dialogue is, is historically correct or not, what he obviously, you know, represents the Athenians as saying is that the only law that matters and the only law that pertains, and it will pertain whether you like it or not, is the law of nature, the law of force. And of course, the way Thucydides doesn't editorialize, doesn't comment, but the way he shows this, you know that he has utter contempt for this view. And of course, what happens, as you know, uh, the men were all slaughtered in Milos and the women and children were taken into captivity. And I, I think that that is something for all time. And the way Thucydides shows us this and also the, the duplicity of Alcibiades underneath this unbelievably um, uh, attractive exterior. Alcibiades, Alcibiades, the lover of Socrates, remember, um, or Socrates loved him, um, yet he was in a way very evil. And all this is shown to us in uh, unsparing detail by um, Thucydides. And thank you, Margarita, for pointing out to me that Alcibiades never won a battle. I hadn't actually 
quite registered that. So, yes, Thucydides, because of the objectivity of his descriptions, the way he isn't commenting, he's, de he's describing how men, mostly men, but how men behave in critical circumstances. He also actually foreshadows postmodernism in, in the, the, the business about the Cretans, where words change their meaning to fit the um, political necessity. You know, what could be a better comment on all the nonsense we have in 2020, um, you know, about not being able to use certain words, words changing their meaning and so on. It's, it's all the same, it's all the same. So much more could be said, but maybe, maybe Professor Monjardino should speak. Thank you very much, Professor. We might go back to you. Um... So I uh, pass the virtual floor to Professor Monjardino uh, to comment on these three speakers. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Orlando. Thank you, Anthony, who many, many years ago, you were the first person to give me a vivid example of what we, what we could do with the great books. And I'm very grateful for, for that amazing moment. And to Patricia, Margarida, and Louise, who represents the great class of 2020. Mm. Um, and as I think they, they showed, and I would like not to speak too much today because this is basically about them and their class, is how amazing it has been to read to CDDs with you this year. And the impact it has had on, on, on you, on the way you see things. It was fascinating to listen to the three of you because this is what tends to happen every year. Uh, the Boston is, is uh, as Patricia said, is a very, very good example. I have a feeling many people fall in love with him, of the things he represents. And this is very interesting. Alcibiades is the same thing. How does to see these operates? How does he write? How does he tell a story? It's incredibly powerful because as Margarita said in the beginning, it's quite hard to start the book, quite difficult to start the book. But as you go along, it feels like theater sometimes, as I think Louise was trying to say and Anthony he was telling us. It's so vivid the way he writes. But as Patricia also said, money is important. It pays a lot of attention to financial power and the ramifications of financial power and how financial power made Athens uh, different. And as Louise said, to see that he's a strategist, he's also an historian. But I think he was a great, great writer. And I think in a way that's what the three of you, at least that's the way I understood it. But there was something fascinating that Margarita said, I think I'm quoting correctly. Um, <laughs> Alcibiades completely divides every year the class. Some people hate him, some people love him. And I could not miss Margarita saying apparent betrayal, <laughs> which is a very nice way of putting things. And I can see most some people in class agree with Margarita, they say it's an apparent betrayal, but other people in class saying bitterly disagreeing or completely disagreeing. So the, the, the funny thing about the reading to see this with you is to see how you react and how the all the class, as Margarita says, everyone has his own to see this. And I think that's one of the great privileges of uh, education at Catholic University is introducing these great books and hope that they will be intellectual capital in your, in your lives. So thank you for being here today. I forgot to mention a very important person who has been extremely helpful. Laura Lisboa, who was with us during our, our journey, this great engineer that converted to political science. So Laura, here's to you too. Thank you. Um, Orlando, could I just make one yes, uh, further point? Um, thank you very much. Yeah. I extend my gratitude to uh, Laura Lisboa. Indeed, she was a grader of this uh, course. 
Uh, before uh, passing the words back to you, Professor O'Hear, we had another question, which I think can be interesting. In a way, we are trying to address it. Um, the student, João Salema Skaira asks, what would Thucydides think and write about COVID-19? Um, he wrote a lot about the plague and that was a very important episode of, of the Peloponnesian War. Um, perhaps I would give the floor to you while you might talk about, uh, yeah. go back to the students or trying to answer yeah. the question right. any way I, you want. I, I, I just wanted to mention that I think that Patricia was, I didn't, I should have said this, was quite right to point out the economic aspects of it. But I would put a question back to her now, she pointed out that Athens was much richer and more progressive in all sorts of ways than Sparta, but Athens lost. Um, as now COVID-19, well, it's all there, isn't it? People consult oracles and they know nothing. <laughs> That's it. And, and I, I have no more faith in the epidemiologists particularly not the epidemiologists, maybe the people who are actually investigating the microbiology of it, they may know something. In my opinion, the epidemiologists know nothing. They're like oracles. Yes, yeah, sort of. But, yeah. but, 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 but political leaders, because they believe in this thing called the science, and of course there is no such thing as the science, um, they're, they're swayed by these charlatans. Um, thank you, Professor. Indeed, we are at their mercy and they are showing quite a great deal of ignorance, indeed. So perhaps I pass the um, word to Patricia to answer to this, this. I mean, at the end, Athens lost. So how was it that possible for the most prosperous and wealthy to lose in the end? Yes, uh, it was a little bit unexpected, uh, at least for me. But um, if we look at all the process Athens and Sparta went through, uh, I think um, the resources was fundamental for Athens to do a lot of innovations and trying to achieve uh, achieve um, a form of winning, of win, but yes, uh, I don't really know how to explain uh, the victory of Sparta, but uh, what I tried to emphasize is how uh, the financial part makes easy uh, being on a war against um, another uh, great power. Hmm. May I say something? Yes, I say something? yes, Professor, please. As Patricia was saying, and I'm sure Margarita and Louise will talk about it, when students realize that Athens is going to, to lose, they tend to be quite shocked. They tend to be quite shocked because we tend to believe that democracies are always better and they always prevail at the end and that democratic societies Democratic societies never make catastrophic mistakes. So I think one of the things that Thucydides tries to tell us, particularly in the second half of the book, is how, in a way, financial power uh, made Athens more, um, um, more, more gave gave Athens more choices to make strategic mistakes. Maybe this great, great wealth that they have gave them an illusion at certain points of the war that they could prevail no matter what. So they fight until the end. It's a bit like reading Sophocles. It's a bit like reading Sophocles for me. Athens seems to be this stunning character that does not understand, at least after a while, what's really going on. So th this financial dimension in a way blinds Athens to the realities of war, particularly in the later stages, later stages of the war. So it's always very interesting to talk with students about this. 
Thank you. And perhaps we could go back to this question about COVID-19 because you were teaching the, um, the plague uh, which occurred during the war um, precisely in the middle of, of our plague. So how was it this year uh, to encompass both what you were teaching and the reality around us? Uh, for me, for me first. Yes, yes. Professor. For me, it was, uh, let's say, peculiar to have read to see these about uh, the plague. Of course, the mortality rate in Athens was overwhelming. Uh, nothing compared with what we have in t today. On the other hand, the Athenians were more, and ancient people were much more aware of the limitations of the human condition uh, than we are, I believe. And now we have this great faith that science can solve all our problems. And I think one of the things that Thucydides tells us is that there are certain things that are, are outside the realm of science that sometimes happen to societies. So for me, it was, uh, say, odd, odd to start a course and midway through it, uh, just after we have read the plague, we had to go into full lockdown. So, and I'm sure for the students too, uh, but what, what, what matters to me, something that I think Anthony said is, life had to go on, strategy didn't die, politics didn't die because of the plague. And it affected deeply Athens. And I wonder by the time this is over with us, what will be the implications for our societies? So, it was quite interesting for me to read to see this with the cast of 2020 with, with this in mind. But I think it will be interesting to listen to them. Uh, how was it for them? Yeah, perhaps we could um, ask back the students about the plague. How was it to um, learn about the plague during a plague? Uh, professor, I, I, was, I was just going to try to answer the first question that uh, Professor Anthony asked about the financial part of the war. I think that uh, money is really important and it's always one of the main uh, problems during the war is how to finance this war. But I think that the question that, um, that the Thucydides uh, leaves is whether or not Athens during the, if. If they wouldn't, they if they hadn't been inside of the conflict, if um, uh, he leaves the question open, if whether or not this war uh, would have revealed an incapacity uh, of um, coming back and uh, uh, rebore, uh, re rise the city uh, in a consolidated regime. So what I mean is that may. Uh, the, one of the biggest um, problems in Athens that Spartan didn't have was their leadership. And um, I think that's one of the main reasons that they lost and, and instead of their financial. That's what I mean, is that their regime was still not consolidated. And that's uh, the reason that they uh, lost for me, at least. And uh, thank you very much. And speaking about regime, yes, the political regimes were very different. And perhaps I would um, pass the floor again to Professor Ahir to speak a little bit more about it, because it's really said that the most, so to speak, democratic, though not exactly like Athens, was the one to lose, or at least to lose in the short run, to lose immediately. Uh, well, they, they we may... now know that the impact of Athens over the long run was much more intense and influential and uh, helped to create the European, the Western civilization we now have um, out of a defeat at war. So perhaps well, democracy was not really at odds with, with victory, I would say. Professor? Well, no, I was going to say, I mean, Thucydides suggests... And the, the, the Athenians made some terrible decisions. I mean, obviously, invading Sicily was a disaster. Um, so, <laughs> um, 
and, and they made other other bad decisions. I mean, and this even, I mean, in a way, to use the footballing cliche, they turned victory into defeat, possibly because um, of hubris. I mean, that might be said. I'm not sure that Thucydides. Well, the thing is about Thucydides, as as everybody has said in different ways, Thucydides doesn't editorialize. He lays things out, and you make, you know, you take whatever judgment he gives you the material to make. And that, of course, is one of his, his strengths. Um, he's not all the time interposing his own views, I don't think, although obviously in the way he selects and writes, he is, but, but, but not in a, in a way that actually lets you know what he's actually thinking. He shows you the results of things. And I think that, um, yeah, I mean, democracies are, democracy is, is no guarantee of, of wisdom or, or right decisions. But then, I mean, I'm not going to defend um, um, oligarchy either, because oligarchs also make terrible um, mistakes, which is maybe why we should read the ancients like Machiavelli and, and find out um, what were good decisions, what were bad decisions, and try to see um, the kind of considerations that, that led people to make good decisions and bad decisions. And, and certainly Thucydides gives you plenty of scope to do that. Thank you, Professor. Now I also have Luis Simas, who might want to reply on that. So please go ahead. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I think I can intertwine both uh, three questions and say that I think that democracies have a price worth paying for, which is when we reach a tipping point, the uh, Greek word stasis, as Professor Miguel Mojolino taught us, um, they obviously will start to make decisions they wouldn't make if the times were easier. And I think what happened both in plague and in the last chapters of war uh, is that Athens failed to understand the geopolitical consequences of their acts. And but what I want to say about this is that Persia was far more um, wealthier, uh, bigger, and yeah. they, they were not quite a democracy as Athens. So I think that may have misled the leaders in Athens to uh, try and rush to the financial solution at the time that was almost nothing compared to what they have at the beginning, they had at the beginning. So uh, it's this tipping point of when a civilization uh, erupts, crashes onto itself and starts making bad decisions whatsoever. Thank you. Thank I you. mean, I think we've also got to, got to remember that, that um, it was the Athenian democracy that put Socrates to death. So, and, and, and I think, although there isn't so much, obviously Thucydides doesn't take it up, right up to that time, but, but he does show you how, um, what, what the potential dangers of democracy are. Um, you, you know, um, very demotic politicians, crowds easily being swayed, you know, particularly in a crisis, no doubt. Um, it doesn't mean we shouldn't be against democracy, but it, but, he, but he's showing, um, yeah, that like all human um, institutions, um, it's riddled with its own imperfections. Yes, well, one of the th going about this, one of the, I think, lessons that to see this tries to teach us is uh, the disastrous impact of a long war in a direct democracy like Athens and how the city that generates, uh, internally speaking, in terms of the leaders it chooses or follows, and in the strategic implications of, um, of, of the war, uh, how, uh, how it gave them more options in a way, yes. to make bad decisions in the long term. But at, at short term, in the first 10 years of the war, in a way, Sparta never manages to, no. to win. It never got that, beyond the long walls, did it? No. No. Yes, no. Uh, 
the, the, the financial dimension, geography, naval power, uh, lots of other stuff we can talk about it t t now, made Sparta's victory impossible. Uh, in a way, Pericles was right in his initial assessment of the war. What he didn't calculate right was how long the war uh, will, will drag on, because he assumed rationality from the Spartan side in assessing the situation. And I think to see that is causing to question this rational dimension in the human condition when making uh, decisions under great stress, which is what happened at the time. Yes, and the Spartans, I think again, as uh, Patricia said, um, they were conservative, fairly rigid in their approach to things. And just by sticking to it, in the end, they prevailed. Would that be a way of looking at it, do you think? Patricia? You know, sticking to their rigid um, ideas and, and uh, kind of policies. Uh, sorry, can you repeat, please? Well, you know, with Athens, when we look at Athens in, in Thucydides, they're always changing their mind. You know, according to what leaders they've got, according to the situation. Whereas, it, you sort of, again, I hadn't really thought about this until we started this conversation, but I just see Sparta as just going the same way all the time, just hitting, not over, not overreaching itself either, but just there and not really changing. Would that yeah, be fair? Uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. No, uh, I think maybe to Sparta, uh, the conservative way they um, they had, maybe at the end of the day was uh, a synonym of stability. Mm. Uh, they didn't uh, have some innovation like Hattons, but keep their ideas and their way to act. Uh, at the end of the day, was was what um, gave gave um, yeah. the the victory. Yeah, but, but but of course it didn't last because they were all wiped out by Alexander within a couple of generations. Yeah, so. yeah and I think that's uh, <laughs> what makes um, uh, the character of Brazidas probably the greatest Spartan infantry officer. So interesting for me, and I think for the students, but Margarita and Luis can also talk about it. Because as you say, Anthony, um, Sparta never managed to innovate strategically in the first 10, 15 years of the war. They didn't know how to win against a power like Athens because Athens was so different. And that's what makes uh, the Brazilian character so interesting because it was the first Spartan officer that had an, a strategic idea. The problem was, to win, as Patricia said, he had to change the structure of Spartan society and Spartan yeah, politics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but his character is, is, is an amazing character. And uh, when we meet him on the beach in Pylos, I think all the students kind of, who is this man? And how does he think and how does he operate? But maybe Margarida and Louise can talk about it a bit. So Margarida? Going back to you. Sorry, I was unmuted. I was muted. Um, I think that the city of Sparta, uh, in addition to being an expressive example of ol oligarchy, uh, presented itself as an exception because managing to structurally uh, bring together political mechanisms that, although controlled by minority, appeared to be the manifestation of the will of the people, of the population. Um, the characteristics that distinguished Sparta model from the other oligarchies, uh, to a large extent, extent were introduced by uh, Likurgo. I think that's how you say his name. Um, and, he yeah. and he promoted um, some modifications. Um, namely with the in, um, institution of the Senate, which, um, which in line with the power of the kings equalized with them in terms of authority and justice. So I think that the oligarchy in, in Sparta 
uh, brings out what Patricia says about um, it's it has a conservative uh, factor, but it still has a, a, a new factor for the for the time that made it con be consistent. Uh, I think. Thank you very much. And just to conclude, we are all praising um, his work and his, to some degree, impartiality while describing the facts. But to see it is, is, is not entirely impartial, right? And I, I feel that most often than not, by the end of this course, the students praise much the character of the uh, Spartan leaders and Sparta's leadership in a way, uh, their qualities and their the way they feel their honor and the way they show their virtues uh, at war, um, their virtuosity at war. So um, could any of you pick up from that and explain his position, his perhaps his inclination, if any? Well, he certainly wasn't um, a fan of public opinion and neither was Plato, who called public opinion the great beast that could be turned in any direction by some clever manipulator, mm. Alcibiades. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. I think when Thucydides decides to write the book, or at least halfway through it, he knows the way he thinks and his opinion is a minority one in Athens, and he yeah. wants to persuade yeah the Athenians and the following generations about his point of view, and you're quite right, he settles some scores, particularly with his bitter enemy, Cleon. Uh, and I think he had a great time describing how Cleon died in Amphipolis. I'm not sure the way he describes it actually happened that particular way, but it's ironic because the man who defeats uh, Cleon, the Athenian demagogue, is the man who defeated Thucydides in Amphipolis and was responsible for his personal exile from Athens. So how do you write that episode? How do you write about the man who defeated you personally, but that killed your political enemy, your personal enemy? So it's absolutely fascinating. And I think he settles mm -hmm. some scores along the way. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the students think about this. And on this subject, uh, I think Thucydides is also the man who uh, most values the intermediary regime between direct democracy and oligarchy, uh, the so-called regime of the 500 that he most cherishes. And so I think this gives us also a look into what, as Professor Anthony O'Hear said, he would like Athens' regime to be, not a direct democracy, where one's opinion could be highly inflated and persuasive of the masses, but some group of, um, let's say, aristocrats who represented the, the police as well and could do better choices. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you yes, very much. Why? In a way, I think it's, it's heartbreaking. Maria. Yes, go ahead, Maria. Maria. Go ahead. Uh, also, I think that uh, uh, the CDBs try to, rep try to represent Brazilians as um, the opposite of, of Pericles, because Pericles represents Athens, um, and uh, Brazilians uh, represents the alienation from Sparta. He represents what Sparta lacks. Um, he, it's true that he um, attempts to react, and that's what makes him different from other Spartans. Um, and he was also the best infantry officer that they had. But um, I think that he feels betray betrayed by Sparta. Um, and it seems almost kind of suicidal. And that's what um, that's why Thucydides gives him this, uh, if I remember right, um, a divine funeral at the end. Yes, uh, in a way, I think we are about to end. But I think Thucydides wrote, read his Omer really well. And Brazidas, in a way, looks like Achilles in the Iliad, this great stunning warrior that is ultimately betrayed by Agamemnon. And I think Brazidas feels at the end that he cannot go back to Sparta. Sparta society, Spartan elite, in a way, will not support him. And I, yes, I agree, Margarita. I think he, I think he sometimes I have the feeling he commits suicide 
and then peopled with that final infantry charge against the Athenians. Yes. So um, thank you very much indeed. I must say that we are receiving here um, some very positive comments, uh, one of which is by Alejandro Chafuen, uh, the International Managing Director of the Acton Institute, and he is saying that this session is very refreshing and he's learning many lessons and, and that we are um, um, teaching very much today with this session, so he's very thankful. We received many others, but let me just emphasize this one. Um, so again, this very iconic and now most interesting session um, um, is at the end. So we'll have to conclude and to wrap it up. Let me just uh, thank Professor Antonio here and Professor Monjardino for chairing the session, as well as the speakers, Luis Simas, Margarida Lee, and Patricia Vaz, as well as all the uh, comments, positive comments and questions we had by, uh, by the public. And um, thank you very much. And I think that we, sh we shall resume by saying goodbye. So thank you very much. And this is it. See you in, in, in the next session. Thank you.